we got the man, right. the myth, the legend himself. The man from the band that has one of my favorite band names of all time, Mr. Marty McCoy <laughs> from the band Boba Flex. What's going on, Marty? Hey, man, I was just listening on the Bill Cosby scandal. <laughs> yeah, how about that, huh? Oh, man, I, like, I, I've been doing a lot of research on it, and I saw that Patton Oswalt said that it's a it's a well known thing in the comedy circuit. Everyone's known it for years that that this is something that he's been doing. That's crazy, right? Yeah, I, I mean, like, yeah, yeah, that's very crazy. I, What's crazy? I, I can't. Is it's Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby could have had sex with these women if he wanted to. The fact that he chose to drug them and do weird things to them while they were passed out is like that's. That's bizarre. Like, there's something really wrong with him. And I didn't want to believe it forever, but it's it's coming to a point where it's like, all right, well, no, nah, there's nothing I can say for you, Bill. <laughs> you got this. You, know, you cannot. You can't stand up for Bill no more. I can't. I wish I want. I wanted to, but you know, like, I, you, just the same thing, like with Michael Jackson and everything. I didn't want to believe that Michael Jackson, and I still don't know if he did or not, because that was a money issue, and people were after money and. I mean, sure. Michael Jackson was a weird guy, of course. He never had a childhood, and he was Peter Pan or whatever. I don't know if he molested children, but I never wanted to believe it, and there was never yeah. any hardcore evidence. But this is not looking good for the old pudding <laughs> pop king, man. <laughs> uh, you know what's even creepier about that whole situation? Some of them scenarios that have been uh, that have been explained by women, like, were in his house, and his wife was present. And, like, she went up to bed and left Bill alone with these women. Oh, Camille, come on. <laughs> I feel like I know the whole family, you know what I mean? Like, I, I've just listened to, like, I just, before all this came out, I, I was bragging about watching his, his uh, stand-up, where well, he's actually sitting down, but his new thing that came out on Netflix, and I was like, he just, you know, he's an older guy, but he's still really funny, and, and it was great, and then all of a sudden, bam, everywhere, Bill Cosby is a serial rapist, and it's just like, how, I mean, what is wrong with people today? You can't trust anybody. It's always the good ones. Yeah, you think yeah. the good ones, the biggest monsters. It's the governor. Yeah. He's the governor on The Walking Dead. Is who he is. <laughs> he's got fish oh. tanks full of fish tanks full of passed out women in his house that no one knows about in a secret room, and it's just crazy, man. What in the uh, heck is going on with Bill Cosby? I, 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 you know what? I'd love to know what like the Cosby kids think. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I wonder if I mean I wonder how long it's gonna be before one of those one of those kids come out and says something that yeah, he, he was awful weird and made me some fruit punch that made me go to sleep a lot. Well you know, the only one I would really expect to come out and say anything is Lisa Bonet because they always were uh you know, there was always fighting going on between those two back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Um I don't know, man. Gosh, come on, Bill I just can't <laughs> believe it. I mean I, I can believe it. I mean it's it's hard to say that it's not true. It's hard to say that that he didn't have something to do. I mean, he had to. Have. Why would I, like, I was listening to the show earlier, and, and it just, you know, she was right. Um, these people are coming out, and that's the statute of limitations, statute of limitations and all that stuff. It's like, there's no gain for a minute. There, no. There's no financial gain. There's no fame. There's no, you know what I mean? It's not something that, that, that you would want to be a part of and, and they're coming out and saying these things because it's true. It's because not right. because they just want to crush Bill Cosby's wholesome dreams and, and his empire. It's, it's because he did it. Yeah. Yep. Crazy, 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 crazy. Uh, I know. I know. It's yeah. awful. And, and you know, when something like that happens too, it kind of like almost crushes your childhood. You know what I mean? Like a memory is crushed. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. There's some part of me that it's, it's hurting me deeply. Like, I can't believe the Bill, the Jello Pudding Pop, <laughs> Cosby, Leonard Six, you know what I mean? Uh, what is going on? How could this be possible? Like, there are monsters, and they're, and they're among us. And it's like I've been watching – I've been on tour for 13 weeks, which is a crazy long tour, and – and doing interviews in the morning and meet and greets and sound checks, so I've missed everything. And and I'm I've been on a walking. I've been home for three days and I've been on a Walking Dead kick. And and the whole theme to the Walking Dead is the monsters are are the humans. And and it's like, yeah, that's the case. I mean, you know, there's a <laughs> yeah, lot of right? people out here. That, I mean, there are there are monsters under our beds. They're called sneaky uncles. Yep, absolutely. Wow, that's that's a very true statement right there. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I've, been, I've had some time to think about things. I've been reading a lot on the road, and my vocabulary is definitely is definitely up these days. It's imp- so. How about that? Like when you're reading more, does and you're saying the vocabulary improves? Does it help with writing your lyrics? Absolutely, I can use words like prolific and things. You know what they mean? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and for instance, I, I, I've been dying to know the answer to this one. Uh, we, we, through your last album, you guys got your big, biggest success yet with, um, you know, I, I wish you're, I'm glad you're dead. And yes. I have to know, was that written for anybody in particular? <laughs> well, um, my, it was a, the song was the brainchild of my brother. Um, he was sitting in a bar one night um, after the show, a club that had a bar in it, because that's where he usually hangs out after the show. Everyone always says, you guys hang out with the fans so much. It's like, I hang out with the fans. My brother's at the bar. That's where they kept him. Uh, <laughs> but he was sitting at the, at the bar one night, and um, a, a guy had come up that was a big fan of the band. And, was, and you know, they were buying drinks back and forth and talking. And, and the guy mentioned that his father had passed away. And Sean's like, oh, I'm really, really sorry. And he goes, don't be. He was a real SOB kind of thing. And, and, and just like my brother looked at me like, oh, my gosh. Wow. So we started to talk about that a few days later and started to talk about that everybody has had someone in their life, whether it be uh, a family member or a boss or even just a public figure like Osama bin Laden or something like that, where when they pass away, you're you're relieved. And, and everybody right. feels like they can't say that out loud. You know, I'm glad he's gone. Some people do, but most people, you know, most normal people – feel that way inside, but don't say anything out loud. And we thought if we would write a song about it where we screamed it as an anthem, (laughs) um, let's see what happens. And and the crazy thing that happened was people really, we found out that people all over the nation and everywhere really connected with that song more so than I thought. I thought they would be, it's kind of dark, it's kind of funny, but people really connected with it. And we received thousands and thousands of emails and phone calls and texts and people coming up at the shows and being like, you know, this song really helped me through this. And and, and we heard countless stories of, you know, weird dads doing weird things or crazy uncles or crazy moms or, or, you know, boyfriends and and just, I mean, it just blew me away. It was like, it was was cool to connect with all these people at the same time. It's really sad. Like, Oh my gosh, there's a lot of monsters out there. And, and, and just the stories that people would tell us that, that it happened to him. I was like, how does this, I mean, you know, we're supposed to be a civilized world at this point in time. And, and there's still people beating their wives within inches of their lives right next door and, right. and, and trapping kids in closets. And, and just, you know, it was just like, I, it was just a really weird cathartic kind of thing. Like, Oh my God, this, you know, we, I, my everyday life is amazing. I have positive people in my life and things are great. My parents are awesome. And, and, but I mean, that's not the case for everybody. And, it was nah. just a, it was like I said it was nice to connect with everybody and give everybody an outlet and but at the same time it was really sad to hear all these stories and, and these things that people had gone through and so we kind of were the the feel good hit of the summer with that song for an outlet for people to get their rage out and scream and 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 have a, a an anthem for I'm glad you're gone you you know so it was it was it was a, it was a bittersweet kind of feeling it was bizarre I, I you know I'm I'm gonna make this prediction now. When Bill Cosby leaves this earth and passes away, all of his yes. victims will be united in one and singing that song, and it will go back onto the charts for you guys. I I think that's a good prediction. The crazy thing that happened to us, um, the Westboro Baptist Church, when Fred Phelps died, it was when that song came out. And it blew up so big on YouTube that YouTube shut it down and thought that we were using bots. And using, I don't even know, I barely know how to use my iPhone. I don't even know what a bot is or a spider or whatever <laughs> that, that gives you fake views. And it, right. like, you can't ask for publicity that big. When he died, I mean, it blew up on the internet. And everybody was sharing this song and saying, this song goes out to Fred Phelps. And, and it was just one of those things where, you know, he was he was one of the guys that the song was written for. That's pretty wild. So I think we forever have a hit with that song, especially if we keep getting monsters into power and 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 monsters into places and in the media. I think that song will never die. Absolutely, yeah. I think you're absolutely right there. Now it's you and your brother in this band, your brother Sean, and yes, you guys been around for about 15 years. The band is there yeah. a lot of? Uh, do you guys have fights or being brothers no. that more? No. 
No, um, the drummer too. My drummer Tommy Johnson is the original member as well. Which I could throw a rock and hit his house from my childhood house. Um, we played together since we were 11 years old, and the the reason that we're still together is because there are no fights, and and we really get along very well. It's a it's a democracy between the three of us, and now the the I call them newer guys that they've been in for a while. But everybody has their say, and everybody like we split publishing, we split everything five ways. We don't, you know, that's how you keep a band together. Yeah, like you don't do the Axl Rose where somebody where Axl Rose gets all the money and everybody else gets paid little increments for you know going out on right. tour. That's how you keep a band together. It's a it's a five way democracy, and and everybody's happy. And and when we make the decisions, we make sure even if I don't agree with it. The other four guys feel strongly about it, and and I trust them enough, or you know, vice versa. That that we, you know, if we make mistakes, it's our mistakes. It's not a record right. label. It's not a manager. It's it's the if we make a mistake, it's ours. If we have a huge success, it's ours, and we feel really good about that. And, and we don't fight. My brother and I got in a fight about 15 years ago, and literally beat the crap out of each other. And neither one of us want to do that again. I don't want hit in the mouth by him, and he definitely don't want hit in the mouth by me because I think I got him better <laughs> but at this point in time there's a line we don't cross with each other and we we uh we speak you know very respectfully to each other even if we disagree and and haven't fought in 15 years and it's it's pretty amazing to to be in a band with my brother and and tommy and and be through go through being this tiny little band in west virginia that nobody thought was going to do anything to to where we're at now and and we did it all together and and you know no matter what the disagreement is or you know, it's it's never anything big. Where I was like, well, I think this, I think this. Okay, let's meet in the middle, kind of thing. But we all we respect each other, and 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 what we where we came from, where we are now, we we really respect each other that way, and believe that you know because of each other is why we're here. And you know, that's so. There's no there's no fighting. It's all that's the funny thing. We just our bus just broke down and. And crew members were flipping out and crying, and and the members of the band are laughing on the side of the mountain with the bus in flames. Like, well, <laughs> we'll figure it out. And like, how do you stay so calm? It's like, well, when you've been through the things that we've been through, nothing really, unless it's a death in the family, nothing really uh, gets you down too much. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I saw, uh, I think it might be like a new promo picture of you guys, and your brother's wearing a yeah. Derek Doll shirt, and I was like, He's wearing my New York doll shirt. Yeah. All right, it's it's even more respect for you guys wearing the dolls. There yeah. you go. My girlfriend got it at a vintage store, so it's an actual vintage. It's not a reprint. It's an actual New York doll shirt that my girlfriend got me, and I couldn't find it, and somehow my brother had just had it on one day. I was like, hey, no, huh? <laughs> Give that back. <laughs> but he asked if he could wear it, and I said, yes, you can wear it because it's cool. And, but, yeah, that's uh, it's, it's an actual New York doll shirt. My girl got it from a vintage place, and it's very uh, – it's a highly, uh, it's very well taken care of. I, I treat it as if it's a uh, expensive kite that that only kite people that fly kites would know about. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, now, something else too. Uh, you and your brother, you guys trade off lead vocals. Yeah. Yes, we do. Now, how do you decide? Like when you're putting the song together, is it kind of like a kiss thing? Like if you wrote it, you're going to sing it, or? Um, kind of. Sometimes uh, it really depends. Like. I, when I grew up playing music, I grew up, my father played bluegrass, and uh, he was amazing, and he had all these amazing musicians come in, and, and what happened was they would all come in and switch instruments, and they would all sing, and I just thought that's how you were supposed to do it, and so when we're writing songs, um, our Dave Tipple, our guitar player, sings very well, too, I mean, he's a great singer, so I mean, he's going to, we're getting ready to write a new record now, and he's going to have spots where he sings lead and our bass player that left the band that was with us for years he was an amazing singer and he sang lead on some songs and it was just kind of like just you know if if you wrote it and you really feel cool about it you can sing it or if I wrote it or Sean wrote it and he thinks it suits my voice better or it suits his voice better it's just kind of like kind of like whatever's best for the song Sean's a little more like a little more insane and a little more growly vocals. I have a little bit more melodic style to my vocals. So whatever we're writing, we kind of know, okay, this will be best for you, and you'll be able to – there's a couple notes in here that you'll be able to nail to the wall that, that I'm not so strong at or vice versa. And it's kind of like whatever's best for the song um, happens, you know. There's no egos in this band. If there were any egos in this band, I'd be like, you stay in the back, you shut up and play guitar, I'm out front. But that's <laughs> not the way it is. 
you know, like growing up, like like you said, Kiss and and Pink Floyd and and the Eagles and bands like that. I just thought that, you know, everybody sings, and that's what makes records interesting and and makes them cool. And instead of that one focused sound where you get tired of the record after three songs, that eh, all sounds the same. Kind of wanted right. to do something a little more deeper than that, and and just was you know that's the way we grew up. Everybody wanted to sing and everybody could sing, so we were like, let's do that. That's awesome. That's very cool. So the new it was album a double-edged out. sword with the record labels. Though. The record labels were like, wow, it's really cool that all you guys sing. It's original. We don't want anything to do with it, but keep doing what you're doing. So it was kind of like, okay, that's why we decided to do our own thing and stay away from the majors after after they went bankrupt and sucked all the money out of us. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other story in itself, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw you in your bio. You guys even said like uh, something about it, and like you know, that's the past, and we've moved on, and like that's it. It's dead subject. Yep, yep. I mean, we have um, when TVT went bankrupt, and it was great. Like TVT signed us and said we're gonna. We, we had all this success with rap, and they did. They had you know Yin Yang Twins and Little John and, and Pitbull, and and they signed us, and they're. The, the way that they signed us was like, we want to show the world that we can come back with rock because they had success with Nine Inch Nails and Seven Dust and a bunch of, you know, default, a bunch of really cool bands. Then they moved over to the rap world, kind of kicked butt on that, and then they were coming back, and Bubble Flex is going to be our, we're going to show the world that we can do rock again. And we're like, yes, this is amazing. This is the dream come true. And, and right when our record came out, they went bankrupt. So we got, we had to fight for years to get free because a bank owned us. When a, when a record label goes into bankruptcy, nobody knows what's happening, not even the $120 an hour bankruptcy attorneys. So it was like we we went out and saw, played shows and sold T-shirts and couldn't even sell records because we didn't own our, you know, didn't own our masters or anything. So we sold T-shirts to pay these attorneys that just told us every week that, okay, you're free, now you're not free. Okay, you're free, now you're not free. So I, I, one day uh, we were in Florida on a tour, and it was desperate times, and we were watching a Tom Petty documentary, and he was like – he said you know, the same thing happened to him when he was younger, and, and that he filed bankruptcy himself, and all the contracts went null and void away. And I was like, that's a great idea. So we called called our attorney. He was very expensive, and, and he was like, that's an amazing idea. I was like, awesome. Can I have 80 grand back? And he was like, no. So I said, okay, your name's going on the bankruptcy as well. So we got away. We got free. I mean, at the time, too, he was like, well, it has to be true. You have to be bankrupt. I said, oh, we are. We, you know, we, we were selling T-shirts to pay an attorney. We're definitely bankrupt. We're not. I mean, this is how we all got skinny, you know, sharing <laughs> dollar cheeseburgers between five people, cutting them four ways. And selling oh, T-shirts, and, and so we got free from that, and, and when Bury Me With My Guns came out and the Hell In My Heart EP and, and, and album came out, all these major record labels started coming around. Like, we love these songs, and we want to do this, and we want to do that, and, and we had deals on the table, and, and we just said to each other, you know, watching TVT, the biggest independent record label there was at the time, go bankrupt, and looking at the, the climate of the music industry, it's like any one of them could go bankrupt. So, yeah. you know, to be stuck in limbo like that was was more scary than than the chance of you know playing stadiums with the bench sevenfold the the fear was bigger than than the than the dream of that happening so we're like we'll just do it on our own um and the benefits of being on your own record label is we won't we won't drop ourselves we'll think that right. we're great and we'll put all of our own energy into this one band bubble flex who we think are amazing and that's what we did and and it's been really good for us i mean we haven't had the commercial success that some bands have had, but I bet we make a lot more money than a lot of those bands. That is the crazy thing to me is like, look how much money that we are making and how much money's coming in. And nobody even knows who we are yet. And if we make, if we have one single that blows up huge and we do it all on our own, it's like, we'll never have to work again. And it was, it was pretty amazing. The difference between going independent and the amount of the money that comes in, when you don't have to share it with people that have dirty hands reaching into your piggy bank every five seconds for silly things. Wow. That, you know, that, that's like so freaking awesome though, to think that way and to be able to do it now in this uh, day and age and really not have to rely on the, on the labels. It's like, yeah, screw them. Do it yourself. Like we were talking to um, Trevor from, uh, Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, uh, Thousand Foot Crutch. And oh, yeah, they do yeah, it. Yeah. And they do it, too. And I mean, they're having tremendous success with it. So, yeah, they absolutely. Are. 
They are. So, I, I keep watching them. I, I watch them very closely, and, and they're doing really well. And, and they just come off the booze cruise, I think, or the rock something cruise. And that's what I really want to do. I want to go on one of those cruises where they pay you to cruise around and play rock music and feed you for free. I think that's just I can, <laughs> if I died, I'd say, yeah, well, we did it all. It was pretty cool. There you go. That's funny. Now, September, the new album came out, Charlatan's Web. Um, yes. And then you guys, like you said, you're on tour and all. Um, you have a new single out now with uh, a new video, which let me tell you something about mm-hmm. that freaking video. That fucking video. <laughs> that opening little story thing. I, 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 I've watched that video like probably a half dozen times this week, and the more I watched it, the more pissed off I would get. I, I was like so <laughs> irritated from the beginning of that video. How did you guys come up with that? Um, the last video, I'm glad you're dead, I directed, and it was such a huge undertaking that my brother was like, I want to direct one. I was like, boom, it's yours. You got the job, buddy. And we were in Chicago on the Man Cow Show, and Dee Snyder walked in, and Dee Snyder was on the air with us for an hour. Like, I was standing like five feet from Dee Snyder. I was like, oh, my God, there he is. He's right there. And he was super cool. And he was. they kept showing the videos and stuff that they did with Twisted Sister, and my brother got all inspired. And he's like, I want to do like a, a Twisted Sister slash uh, – what's the uh, Natural Born Killers kind of soundtrack laughy kind of thing in the beginning. And, and I was like, sounds great, man. And, and he totally did it all himself. He and the director, Paul Cunningham, got together and, and they directed. I just showed up and sang in this video. I didn't have to direct or anything. It was an amazing experience. I just got my makeup done, sang for like two hours. and was like, cool, let me know when it's done. And that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he, no. he just came up with this whole campy 80s. You know, my brother's totally 80s, totally Motley Crue and, and – and just came up with this whole thing and wanted to go back to, you know, standing there in front of one of his idols, um, you know, D. Snyder. He was like, I got, I got it. I know what I want to do for this video. So he came up with the whole concept, and, and I thought it was hilarious. I can't believe that she gets turned on by Hamburger Helper. And I was just like, this is too <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, and, and people really need to see the behind-the-scenes video too, where with the with all the girls and all hopping around on the bed. And you got there's a guy that just comes in with a water bottle and squirts the girls down. I'm like, how much does that That's guy? That's my brother. Get like, That's gone. I, your, that was your brother. I was going to say, like, yeah. how do you get that dream job? And how much does that job pay? That was Sean. He did it for free, and and I can see why he did it for free. Like I, after I saw. The, him doing that, I was like, he is, he's paying himself right now in his own mind, and it was really creepy when you see it on the video, because that's Sean, he's like, nope, more water, spraying on the girls, I was like, okay, I'm going outside, <laughs> my girlfriend was with me, so I'm outside playing Candy Crush while my brother's in there spraying girls and throwing feathers on their half-naked bodies, and my girlfriend's in there doing makeup on them and stuff, and like I said, I, you can tell that, you can, <laughs> I just... My bass player, too, was there, um, and he just joined the band when we were shooting that video. That was his first video with us. And he comes out, and they're drinking liquor, and there's half-naked girls, and he's like, this is the best time of my life. I can't (laughs) wait to go on tour. He's just having a blast. And and like I said, I'm out there playing Candy Crush. I'm like, okay, look at the clock. What time is it? What time is it? I've got to go home. Let's get out of here. (laughs) So, yeah, my brother completely came up with that whole idea, and, and everything creepy comes straight out of his mind in about 20 seconds, and it was just, he's made for doing stuff like that. I mean, he's so creative. Like, I just sit and watch and, and pick the, sometimes when we're writing, I just watch him and pick the ideas that I think are good because he spews thousands of them in, in minutes. That's awesome. That is, I'm telling you, people got to see that video. It's a great video. It's a great song. As a matter of fact, I got it queued up to play. But before we play and let it, I let you go, uh, something else that was, well, actually, this is actually more important. Um, New Year's Eve, you guys are playing uh, where Dimebag was killed. And I, and I know you guys yeah. played there before. Um, what's it like going there, man? I mean, the, the, is it kind of like I, – I was just thinking, like, I would get so sad. Well, um, we we came up in that club, and it was one of the places where, being from West Virginia, we came to Columbus, Ohio, and, like, there's this club you got to play called the Alvarez Vila, and it's one of the oldest-running rock clubs in the country, and we're like, cool. And we went there our very first time, and I remember my jaw dropping. Like, there's an actual, like, the first time I saw a real music scene where there was a goth band playing and a punk band playing, and there was thousands of kids, you know, hundreds and, like, a thousand kids there to see all these bands. And, and I just remember, like, my jaw dropping, like, a music scene. I've heard about this. I've read about this, like, in, in L.A. in the 80s and, and in the 70s, and, and to me, it was this big, huge, crazy music scene, and it was awesome. And we came up there, and we were like the first local band to ever, to ever sell it out on our own, and, 
And nice. the owner, Rick Catella, who is a dear friend of mine at this point, was so good to us and, and, and great to us. And, and, and so were the fans in Columbus and the radio station, The Blitz, in Columbus was one of the first places. How Fish was one of the first program directors to take a chance on us. So we have a lot of history there. And when that happened, we were on tour with Seven Dust. And I've met Vinny Paul several times. I unfortunately never got to meet Dimebag. I heard he was one of the coolest guys in the world, and, and, that, and that's very sad. And everybody speaks so highly of him and just said he was the nicest person in the world, made you feel like he was your friend. And, and, and But we were on tour with Seven Dust, and the phone calls started coming in, and everybody was there. Like our friends were there, like, oh, my God, some, this just happened, this just happened. And I remember telling uh, Clint from, from Seven Dust about it. I was like, hey, I just heard this. And he just falls to his knees crying. And, and all the guys in Seven Dust are, are – LeJean's wearing a pair of cowboy boots that dime bag him a week before. And oh, wow. it, was, it was a horrible, horrible thing that happened there. But the people at the Al Rosa Vila are, are nice and kind people. And, have you know what I mean, that place has bad memories for a lot of people – and good memories for a lot of people. And, and right. that's the thing, like, we've always continued to play there because it was one of those places that, that some of my best times of my life happened there and, and with the band. And it was one of those places that we were able to go play and make money and go out to other other markets and not make any money. And because of the Al Rosa Vila, we, we, you know, we were able to continue building the Bogle Flex brand and, and going out and losing our, our butts in some market and come back to the Al Rosa Vila and make a – but ton of cash. Are we allowed to cuss? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, a ah, ton of cash. <laughs> I'm trying to say, but I don't, I don't really talk like that. I just wasn't sure if we were allowed to curse on the radio. Uh, you know, it was just one of those places that was always really good to us, and, and the people that worked there, and, and and some of the people that you know that were that were that got hurt there. You know, are dear friends of ours, and and it was a. I just, it was an unfortunate thing that happened. A very unfortunate and tragic thing that happened. And the people that worked there and, and put their lives into this place, it wasn't their fault. And right. it wasn't something that they needed punished for for the rest of their lives, which they have been in many ways. But it wasn't something, you know, that they had control of and so, and something that they needed their their dreams and everything taken away from them because of this insane person that thought that the Pantera lyrics were speaking to him and, and – you know what I mean? It was it was it was this guy yeah. that had mental issues. He had very. It can happen to anybody, and, and sure, it's just it's just one of those things. It's like you know, I mean, you you heal and you, and you you try to move forward, and and we were just weren't gonna let the stigma of of these bad things that that happen all over the place ruin this place that was was a, a dream to us and and made our dreams come true. You know, it really did. Right. I mean, without the Alro Sevilla, Boba Flex wouldn't be here. Well, I mean, that's awesome. You guys still support the place and try to, you know, keep a good memory oh, we alive can play about it. In Columbus, Ohio, we could play much bigger places <laughs> at this point in time <laughs> in our career. But they've been so good to us. And, and, and you know, like I said, it's we, we tend to not turn our backs on people that have that have been there and stuck with us through times when they shouldn't have. And, and just, you know, just kind of like it was, a, it was a conscious decision between the whole band, like, let's let's go here and, and – and keep bringing people back to this place. And, and I mean, it's a beautiful place, and it's a there's a lot of musical history. There's a lot of history there. I mean, and and, it's, and it'd be a shame for it to close down because some crazy psycho dude that should have been in a hospital, you know, made some crazy move that that destroyed the the metal world for a long time. Right. Absolutely. Well, Marty, I want to thank you so much for everything, uh, dude. The door is always open. The phone line is always. That's got a cool show, by the way. I was listening in and everything. It's like, what a cool show. And, and the scary part is, my friend, you're going to be the team show of tonight because it's going to get a little crazier later on in the show. <laughs> All right. Well, if I'd have known I'd have cursed, I could curse. It'd have been a lot. it have been a lot wilder. <laughs> so, uh, you know what? Then come back. We got to set you to come back and curse and, and be okay, able to absolutely. Cur- curse a lot, and we'll play more music too. All right, well, thanks for thinking about us and having us on the air, and, and I really appreciate it. And uh, jam that song, Never Coming Back. It's a big hit. It's going to blow everybody away. Absolutely. Marty, you and the guys have a great holiday season, and uh, we'll talk to you in 2015 and get your asses up here to Philly. Absolutely. On our way right now. Awesome. Thanks, man. Have a Let's, good one. All right. Later, bro. See ya. All right, we're going to play that song a little later in the show because right now we have 
<laughs> Let me see. Let me get Nick on here. Nick, is that Bob on there? <laughs> no, it's not. I sent you a message in um, private. Uh, he wants you to give him a call at his hotel. That way the interview can go longer than 10 minutes. So the number's in there and his room number is everything in there. So if you want to play the song and get him on the phone, that would be fine. Gotcha. Okay, that's exactly what I'll do then. All right, so here's the song, Boba Flex, Never Coming Back. Enjoy it. And go check out the video because you, you have to see the video. I want to know if people get as annoyed as I did while watching that video. So here's Boba Flex, Never Coming Back. <laughs> 